Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on a Farm Week feature show, we start with a story on agritourism, a family favorite. In Southern Gardening, the gateway to Mississippi State is also a landscape showcase. Plus, it's the most common row crop in the U.S., worth $75 billion a year, but what is corn? And the conclusion of our behind-the-scenes story on Bull Bottom Farms. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Jonah Holland. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. Mike is away on assignment. We've got an interesting show lined up for you and we're going to start with a fun little story about agritourism, a place called Bull Bottom Farms in Duck Hill, Mississippi, west of Starkville, about 75 miles. Agritourism is a growing part of the state's economy and this operation started with an idea. We were young, just starting to have kids, and we we're like, hey, you know, we gotta make this make a living for us, you know? It's not just, let's go have some fun. Just kind of brainstorming and um, looking around online and trying to figure out ways that you can increase income on a farm, and ag tourism was something that popped up, and I thought, we can do that. I know we could do that. People from all over come, and they love it, you know. And it just makes us feel good to be able to provide something like this. The parents are excited about being here. You can tell that they love seeing their kids so excited. It's been more than what we ever expected it to be. You know, we run into a family and just ask them how they, you know, where they come from and if they're enjoying it. And, they're like, well, would somebody come from this area and another one came from this and we just met here and just spent the day together. You know, that's, that's what we wanted to make happen out here. We have the little kids come out here four or five years old. Well, they bring their aunts and uncles and, you know, it's just a, it's a family thing. You come out here and, and just, you get to be a kid again. It's so special and sweet to see parents out here playing, pushing them on a swing. Yeah, it's special, it really is. My father bought this place back in 1943. Uh, bought it from a guy named Jim Bull, and that's where we get the Bull Bottom. And I started farming right out of high school and have now been farming since 1975. So it's about 45 years. We went to high school at Grenada Lake Academy and she was the prettiest little girl there. So <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> After we had the kids and all, we, uh, I used to go to the field and you know take lunch and all with the kids and stuff because I, I didn't work. I stayed at home, of course, poor kids. And uh, we, but we used to go to the farm, to the field where they was working and picnic, you know. <laughs> well, they was raised on the farm, but uh, none of them really were that interested in farming. And uh, yeah, I mean, I grew up farming with them and helping and all of that, and was getting ready to go to college. And I thought, okay, when I get get through with college, that's the last thing I'm going to do is farm. And I tried to get him involved in farming and he farmed for a year and uh, got to meet Katie. And once he met Katie, it was pretty much the end of him in the farming. Nick and I met um, when I was a senior in high school and um, we started dating and just have been together ever since. That was in 1999. But she had n no idea about farming. I used to get her out here whenever we was dating in college and stuff, and I'd get her on a tractor, and you know everybody thinks they're so difficult to drive, so I'd get her on there and have her disc in a field or something, and I'd get off and I'd go get on another tractor so we could get through and get through early. And uh, her dad's like, you don't need to let her drive one of those tractors now. <laughs> Looking back now, he was just flirting with me, I know that, but it was fun though, I mean, really fun. And I got to know his family and um, just fell in love with them, and 
my parents said, you're going to college. We don't care where you go, but you're going. So I chose Ole Miss and um, he was already farming with his dad and going to school at that time. And he decided he might want a career change. So he came on to Ole Miss too. So we were both there. We graduated from Ole Miss on the same day. And they moved to Suffolk, Virginia. He wanted to get as far away from his farm as he could. Virginia was a little far from home. So Nashville and we enjoyed it, and, but we was getting ready to have kids and that's when it was like, okay, we want to be close to family. I had uh, previously been working a job and with the economy being what it was in 2008, I was laid off and uh, I talked with my county agent to see what we could do here at the farm to generate some income. And we had decided that we really wanted to get back home and Nick had done row crop with his dad before and so we knew that the way that the row crop stood that it wasn't going to support two families. And he said, have you ever thought about ag tourism? I said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. We just started doing a lot of research and checking out other farms that already did it. She got out and was like, had pictures of, you know, eight school buses in the parking lot. You know, this is all in Tennessee, outside of Nashville, you know, plenty of populated area. And um, she was saying, well, I think we could do it down there. And, you know, I was like, I don't know, that's in Duck Hill. I don't know about that, you know. When we put our heads together, we just decided we're going we're gonna to try this. When I made the decision to try and do this, I was telling my wife, Vicki, I said, uh, I think I'm going to do this, Vicki. She said, Earl, you have no idea what you're getting into. And she was exactly right. I had no idea that this thing was going to do as well. And I thought, it's going to be a lot of cleaning up to do back there because it, it had been a farming place, you know, since Earl was born. So I just knew we had a lot of cleaning up. And I said, you know, we, we got a lot of work to do if that's what y'all want to do. And I was skeptical about it. I felt like it's more work than we were going to be able to do. Whenever he got ready to start doing it one summer, we were like, okay, let's plan to move back and help him with this. And we, it took us a year to get moved back. The first year we drove from Nashville to Grenada every weekend, um, four, four and a half hour drive every weekend after working all week on the road because we were both in outside sales at the time. But, um, but I mean, it was totally worth it. We knew after the first time we came and did it, we were like, this is it. Fun story. So what happened next? How did the agritourism side of Bull Bottom Farms actually get off the ground? Well, stick around. We'll have the rest of that story later in the show. But trust me, Katie Robinson's idea of how to blossom the operation turned out to be a good one. As you may know, Farm Week originates out of Mississippi State University. This week in our Southern Gardening segment, and as students come back to school after the winter break, Gary Bachman showcases landscaping at the very gateway to the university. Here's Gary. I love coming to the Mississippi State University campus and seeing all the colorful plantings everywhere you look. One of my favorites is the University Drive entrance, which features a beautiful planting around this historic brick memorial to the class of 1922. Alocasia anchors this semi-shaded bed with the showy annual plants offering a bold tropical effect to the landscape. Its shield-like green leaves point majestically upward, catching the eye as they sway in the breeze. Purple fountain grass is aptly named for the spikes of gently nodding purplish flowers with their exquisite appearance that gracefully spray out of its mass of long, slender, burgundy-colored leaves. The Hamlin Dwarf Penicetum grass is an additional attraction here with its fluffy, buff-colored flower plumes above the green fountain of foliage. Planted in mass throughout the bed is the sensational electric lime coleus. The 2010 Mississippi Medallion winner is absolutely stunning. The close-up details found in the brightly colored lemon-lime pattern foliage, and there's no better way of saying it, are electrifying. Also mass planted in the bed are French marigolds. These are known for their yellow, gold, and rusty brown colored flowers. Generally, 
less than 15 inches tall, French marigolds make a great free flowering mat of color. The beautiful landscape plantings create a positive environment for campus life. I'm MSU Extension Horticulture Specialist Gary Bachman, and I hope you'll join us for the next Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right there, but don't go away. Coming up in our final Farm Week feature, the conclusion of our story about Bull Bottom Farms. The farmland has belonged to the Robinson family since the early 1940s, but all these years later, an idea for how to work the farm and make it both profitable and appealing to the public is growing in the hearts and minds of the Robinsons. It's an idea called agritourism. The rest of the story coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Every day, real people are solving problems, learning skills, and achieving goals through extension education we care about their success and yours. Extending knowledge, changing lives. The MSU Extension Service. This week in the market, something a little different. We talk about many commodities, but sometimes it's good to take a closer look into what exactly they are. Corn is a uh, regular on the show with supply chain and weather issues, the price jumping up and down just like wheat and soybeans, and like those grains, corn is a valuable asset. But why? Here's a special report I produced to answer the question, what is corn? Corn, a common sight in ag country. You can travel miles and see nothing but graceful stalks swaying in the breeze. In Mississippi, it's the fourth highest commodity with over 129 million bushels produced in 2021. Not only that, but nationwide, U.S. corn growers produced 15.1 billion bushels last year, according to the USDA. So, what makes this plant so unique? What exactly is corn? Corn is a, is a temperate plant that is grown in, in areas of significant rainfall, uh, but moderate conditions overall. It likes uh, mild temperatures, um, plentiful rainfall, but not abundant rainfall like you'd have in tropical regions. And it's, a, it's an annual grass plant, which means that we plant it in the spring. It has a relatively long growing season. It's about 120 days or about four months in length. It's planted early in the spring. It grows through the summer. And in Mississippi, it's harvested late in the summer. In areas, other, air, other regions of the United States, it would be in the fall. Like most row crops, corn has several growth stages experts refer to. VE through VT 
measure the plant's growth from seedling to fully grown and tasseling. R1 through R6 are the reproductive stages that produce the corn on cobs we're familiar with. A, a corn plant is unique in that it has a separate male and female part on the plant. The tassel is a male part that sheds the pollen and the ear contains silks which receive the pollen and are basically the female organ on the plant. Corn is somewhat unique in that it cross-pollinates so the neighbor, neighboring plants actually provide the pollen in many cases to uh, pollinate the ears on, on the plants in the adjacent rows. So that's why you oftentimes need to plant more than one or two rows in your garden because you need some physical space in order to facilitate the movement of that pollen to the, to the ears on a separate plant in order for it to pollinate. There are many kinds of corn varieties, but the one most commonly grown in the U.S. is not what you'd find in the grocery store. Most of the corn that's grown in fields is what we call dent corn. It is developed because it, it produces a lot of starch, has a good feed value. Ears of corn that you would buy at the grocery store is gonna be sweet corn. The type of plant is the same, it's just bred for a different purpose and it, it, it has completely different characteristics as far as the kernels and the, the content of those kernels. It has less starch in the kernels and more sugar content, more water, and it just tastes better. It's a lot more palatable to humans. Sweet corn is picked during the middle of the grown or during the middle of the reproductive stages before the kernels are completely mature. Corn that is um, harvested for, for normal use, you let the kernels completely mature and then actually dry down to a, to a moisture that is suitable for long-term storage for use in bins and other facilities that hold grain. So, the vast majority of corn grown in the U.S. is used as animal feed, but there are some other well-known uses for corn, such as ethanol or biodiesel, corn syrup, a common sweetener, and the starch itself, commonly used in cooking. But it's not just feed and industrial use that makes it popular. It also works well with other crops. Corn is used in Mississippi primarily as a crop that, that complements our other two primary row crops in Mississippi in a crop rotation system. So corn is used and is grown in a field one year and then we rotate that field the next year to cotton or soybeans generally. So that helps eliminate a lot of the uh, pest issues, whether it be weeds, diseases, or insect issues. It eliminates a lot of those or greatly reduces the likelihood of those being a significant problem. Plus it has a significant benefit to both of the crops involved in the rotation system, which enhances the productivity of, of those crops as well. So, what are the major problems farmers face when growing corn? Corn is a little bit unique in that uh, it is much more sensitive to what we call stand issues or emergence issues. Not only do we have to deal with having restrictions to plant the crop, but corn is very intolerant or very sensitive to issues that you know, where we lose a certain percentage of the, of the seedlings that don't successfully emerge or they're delayed and stunted during the, the planting process and, and uh, the management and environmental restrictions that occur shortly after seeding the crop. Corn is a valuable ag commodity, not only because of its versatility, but because with a little care and good weather, it can produce an abundance of grain. It's a productive crop too that, that produces a lot higher volume of grain than a lot of our other row crops that are grown. Not only is it a high quality source of feed, it, it produces a high volume as well. So, that's corn, a major player in the ag markets, grown all over the world, valued for its high output and many different uses. Special thanks to Dr. Eric Larson of Mississippi State Extension. Sometimes I think it's good to get back to the basics of what makes a commodity a commodity, so to speak. Corn is certainly a fascinating plant we've made great use of. Back now to the rest of our story on Bull Bottom Farms in Duck Hill, Mississippi, a charming story about agritourism. Katie Robinson, the daughter-in-law of landowner Earl Robinson, has the perfect idea for how to present the farm to the public. From producer Jonathan Parrish, here's that story. I remember calling him one morning and we had already been talking about all this. And I said, Earl, I have thought of what we're gonna put on everything. And he said, what? And I said, we're gonna say Bull Bottom Farms, bringing families together since 1944. 
And so anyway, he's like, I love it. And I said, because Earl, that's what it's doing. It's bringing us back together. And I said, and people are gonna be coming out there with their kids and spending family time together. And it's been about family since the get go. One of the things that has uh, really made me proud is I'll see a, a family that lives in Columbus, one in Greenville, one in Hernando, and they meet here for the day. And it's, I, that's what goes on. Kids come out here and letting them experience agriculture and you know, letting them have fun and just you know, have families together. It's just nice to see the parents bringing the kids and moms and dads and grandparents and, and all and everybody just loves it and tells us all the time how nice it is and all. And then you see the little ones going home crying after they've been here most all day and they cry because they do not want to leave. They just want to keep going. Yeah, I love it. She was all in whenever it got to, you know, us moving back and being back home and working with us and uh, we all work good together most of the time. The first weekend we opened, we probably didn't have 30 people out here. Uh, the next day on Saturday, we probably had 50 or 60 people out. And on Sunday, it was the same way. The next weekend, she comes out with cowboy boots, new jeans, she's on board, you know. <laughs> you can tell if she went and spent some money to get to looking like a cowgirl, she's ready to go then. Once we started clearing up and had all our ideas in our head and what we were going to do, and I was, I was excited about it. We all were. This is her backyard. She said from day one, if we're just going to invite a bunch of people over here, it's going to look good now. We tell her, we say she's the president of the beautification committee. <laughs> you know, the little kids come for the things to play on, but the adults, you know that they the ones that love outdoors and gardening and all like that. So yeah, you want the grounds to be pretty. She and I, we just play off of each other and we both enjoy a lot of the same things. We like to decorate and that kind of stuff. And so that kind of goes hand in hand with making the farm look pretty and um, the gift shop look cute and you know, just all of those kind of things she and I work really good together on. We couldn't do it without her because, I mean, as much, many phone calls she gets and, you know, handling the booking and reservations and all of that, you know, we'll get a school group out here and I'll be getting them, and I'm like, where y'all, where y'all from, what school is it? And like, I don't have a clue what school it is. Like, she handles all of that. I want every ch group to feel like they're an only child. So when they're here, they know who their group leader is. She knows where she's taking them. We don't like them to run into each other. Um, when you're at the slide, you're the only class at the slide. As Katie started working, we do school groups during the week, and she, being uh, the age she is, she was able to communicate with the teachers, which were her age. Me and Vicki, we hit the road, and we went to all the schools that we could get to and started just dropping flyers off and just telling them about, you know, hey, tell your teachers to give us a call if they're interested in field trips. and. Turns out there's nowhere to go to a field trip around here, so they all started calling. And we'll have something that we can I mean, we went and did things together because she's more the business person and she's got the ideas and she knows how to spread the word and you know, and so it was nice when they were back. You know, it's a lot of moms that are bringing their kids, wanting to find something for their family to go do, and so you know, her opinion and you know, ideas of what we ought to do or what we should add or you know, ways to improve it and make it better and make it a better experience for our customers. Like, you know, that's, couldn't ask for anything better. It is hard work and it can be stressful, but it's totally worth it. I mean, if you have a job where you get to be around your kids and your family as much as I do, I mean, you got it made. On Saturday morning, when the people are lining up to come in, they're the ones that's gonna take care of all of that. I may be in the cotton field picking, uh, but you don't have to worry about it. They're gonna take care of it, you know? And so they are bull bottom farms. We take just as much pride in it as Nick and Earl do, really, even though this is Earl's family's land and she and I just kind of married into it, you know? But, um, but I mean, now my kids are growing up out here. So I mean, a piece of my heart 
is, is going to hopefully be here for the long run. So, uh, yeah, she and I are just as proud of it as they are. A whole new meaning to the words family business. Well, next week, if it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck, right? We literally get our ducks in a row. Or rather, one company in Indiana does. The state that became number one in the nation, raising more than half the country's supply. We'll visit the Hoosier State, where farmers are handling challenges like water off a duck's back. And though duck meat is more popular in places like China, these guys are working to make the market all it's quacked up to be. That's next time on Farm Week. And before we go, you'll probably get a kick out of this. Farmers are good at multitasking, but this one making good use of his vacuum cleaner right there in the cab of his tractor. Of course, tractors can get all dusty out there in the field, so this farmer taking a moment to make sure every little speck of dust gets picked up. Gotta hand it to him, all nice and clean. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.